Have you ever heard of the dead man's cell phone situation? It's only gotten traction in recent years, of course, now that phones appear to know more about a person than their own friends and family members do. The situation is named for a play by the same title which premiered in 2007, and it's all about a woman who, just like the player character in the game Sarah is missing, finds a cell phone that's clearly missing its owner. The usual questions you think about associated with this kind of thing come up, but during a playthrough of Sarah is missing, there are many more issues presented than a player expects to encounter, like a very literal case of a cell phone missing its owner. The itch.io page for the game summarizes the plot like this. Sarah has disappeared under mysterious circumstances, and your only lead is her mobile phone. Search for clues by investigating Sarah's personal messages, notes, emails, pictures, and videos while trying to piece together her final days. Unlock password-protected files, uncover hidden messages, and decrypt lost data and figure out where she went, what she did, and how someone can disappear without a trace so suddenly. And from the beginning of the game, you aren't allowed to forget how important it is that you find Sarah. Her phone's AI system, Iris, is taking it way more seriously than you are throughout the journey. That's spelled I-R-I-S. Kind of sounds like another well-known smartphone AI whose name is spelled S-I-R-I, -I, right? Except that the inspiration for Iris isn't anywhere near smart enough to do half of what this app is capable of, and it expresses what seems like emotion based on its prime directive, claiming it has wants after being challenged about sounding human. It wants to find Sarah, the phone's owner, and encourages you to find the truth about what's happened to her. Which is funny coming from an AI that doesn't come across as trustworthy at all. In fact, Sarah's Missing presents a situation that nobody seems to be catching in almost every major playthrough you can find on YouTube. Your responsibility is to find Sarah, to know the truth about where she's gone, but in almost every single area of the game besides that, the truth is what's actually at stake. That's what you're really trying to fight for. Sarah is missing may as well have been called Sarah is lying because there are contradictions, logic mistakes, and misdirection all over this story. Let's go back to the beginning, even before we meet Iris, the AI that sounds way too human. Before you're allowed to do anything, you're shown that Sarah's phone has suffered a system failure. There's no moving forward until you agree to a system restore. Once you do, the phone gets to work, but in trying to pull the messages together, it suffers a crash in the form of a jump scare. It looks just like one of the images you'd see in the first haunted video that you open later in the game. Right after this, we get to meet Iris and play the game, and that's where the first major mistake comes in for most people who seem to go through the experience. We already know the phone's been infected. The entire system is compromised. Not only did we need to perform a system restore just to get it working, the jump scare makes it very clear this phone is not okay. What Iris is offering you is a false sense of security in having a knowledgeable companion. And even then, your introduction should be enough to tip you off that Iris is not worth trusting. Welcome back, Sarah, it says. This phone appears to be damaged and you don't appear to be Sarah. Have we met? The phone is aware that you're not its owner, but instead of asking how it knows that, you're given dialogue options that lead you away from finding out. An iris is part of an eye which allows dilation of the pupil for the amount of light that comes in which is the very same function of a camera aperture, a structure we see as the icon for the iris application. Both of these are clues to let you know something very important. Iris is watching you through the phone's camera. It knows that you're not Sarah because it can see you. So, in the very beginning of the game, you open a smartphone that we see has been compromised with something malicious. We meet an application that very clearly has access to the camera pointed at your face. And that application is an AI system that sounds way, way too human to be genuine, to the point that the game itself wants you to be made aware of it. These are major red flags. Next up, we move into the messages where the bulk of our information can be found. Here's where we start to understand that we might not be able to trust Sarah either. On February 14th, which was both Valentine's Day and Sarah's birthday, she sent out a few messages. Some to Derek, her ex-boyfriend who had only just become an ex, and her mother. Derek, the ex-boyfriend, very much comes across as someone who's been broken up with. He expresses that he wishes the relationship could continue and that things had been different while Sarah is very clearly angry and offended. She says to Derek, Things ended when you left. You left. A few messages later, we know why he left. He's a photographer who accepted a job to go to another country and shoot nude models, and he must have waited until the very last minute to let Sarah know. Those are the circumstances around their breakup. Derek left on a job he didn't tell Sarah about because it involved nude model photography and leaving the country, and just to really dig the knife in, it happened on Valentine's Day, which was also her birthday. 
Derek doesn't want the relationship to end, but Sarah has decided that it's over. So why does she later tell her mother, Derek and I have decided to end things, and tells Buddy, Derek broke up with me? The truth is that Sarah broke it off with Derek, but she's changing up her story with two different people when it's not necessary. We may be going through her phone, but how much can we actually learn about this person by doing so? We may not even be able to trust what we find on here. The next issue that comes from the text messages is a really weird one, and the circumstances around its meaning may actually be simple and kind of foolish, or might mean a whole lot to the investigation. For this, we turn to Sarah's worst contact, Buddy, who begins sexually harassing her through text right after talking about thesis projects for school. Sarah says that she's too busy to hang out because she needs to compose her final thesis. Buddy asks what she's writing about, and even though Sarah is noticeably cynical about his interest, he says to go for it. We then receive a message from Buddy. I'm doing a research on the relativity of ghost to culture and how it transcends from verbal tales handed down through the generations to a digital and cyberspace hauntings. Here's the problem with this. The message from Buddy came through on February 30th. When you unlock the gallery for the phone, you also unlock Sarah's videos. We know from the very first video we were shown that videos are named after the day they're taken by default. The cry for help video Iris showed us is titled 2016-0430. That's April 30th, 2016, the night Sarah disappeared. We have a lot of evidence from late in the game that marks as the night before we find the phone when she was attacked by a kidnapper. Keeping this in mind, when you go through Sarah's videos, you'll find a recording from March 27th that has Sarah talking about whether or not ghosts are still relevant in today's society. She rambles a bit about the history of ghost stories, the inclusion of the vampire legend, and the modern adaptation of ghosts that work through cyberspace. It's basically the entire concept that we just got from Buddy. We learn through Sarah's conversations with her mother, Faith, and James that she's studying parapsychology, which is the scientific study of the supernatural. It makes sense that Sarah would be rehearsing what seems like the rough draft for a research paper on this topic because of the messages that we've read. After all, the email she receives later from her school reminds her that the deadline for submitting a final thesis is April 30th, so she only has just over a month left. But if Sarah is the parapsychology major, why would Buddy come across as saying that he's doing a thesis paper on the same exact thing much earlier? I'm going to level with you here. I think there's a pretty strong possibility the developers of the game just had a major, major typo when it came to this section. Look at the flow of conversation. Buddy asks Sarah what her thesis is on. She asks if he really does want to know. He says yes. And by the nature of dialogue, we should be seeing Sarah's reply next, which we would guess is about parapsychology stuff. But instead, we get Buddy offering what his thesis paper is about. Which, actually, doesn't seem all that out of line with a natural dialogue flow. Because we have Buddy, who obviously wants something from Sarah, offering free information so he can establish common ground in pursuit of his ulterior motives. But does that really seem like something Buddy would be into? It's really tough to gauge how seriously we can take him. But we do have some evidence to back up the idea that Buddy is only friends with Sarah because he's into parapsychology. If you go into her email, you'll find a message from Buddy about a chainmail warning. Hey Sarah, I'm forwarding this to you. It's from a friend and I think you should be careful. The portion of the message he's forwarding reads as follows. Beware of emails with strange attachments. There's a chain email going around and I strongly advise you do not read it and most importantly do not open the attachment. It can come in any shape and form, but always with a particular video attachment. It is said that whoever watches the video will bring upon a bad omen. The sender will also encourage you send the video to people you know. If you receive such content, please delete them from your phone. Only you can prevent the spread of malicious content on the web. So, Bunny is actively sending Sarah things in her field of study. It may be another tactic to establish common ground so that he can get closer to her, but just for the moment, let's give Buddy and the developers of the game the benefit of the doubt. Maybe Buddy genuinely is interested in parapsychology, and that's how he met Sarah. How else would she have come around to making such a pervert a personal contact? Let's look at this again with the frame of mind that he's legitimate. The message from Buddy about his research came through on February 30th. On March 27th, almost a full month later, we have a video of Sarah discussing that exact topic, as if she's recording herself reading a rough draft, or just thinking out loud, or both, trying to develop her idea. If the message from Buddy about research into the relevancy of ghosts in the modern age in cyberspace hauntings is not a typo, it means one of two things. Either Buddy has been creeping around in Sarah's online information or on her phone, which makes him a hacker, or Sarah actually stole his thesis for her own paper. And because Buddy sent an email warning Sarah against the allegedly haunted video chainmail that she did receive which compromised her phone, it pretty much rules him out as a hacker. 
He wouldn't warn Sarah against opening Danger's attachment if he needed her to do exactly that to get into her system. If you needed someone to fall for a trap that involves picking up a virus from touching a doorknob, then you don't warn them against touching a doorknob that's been used by someone who has the flu. The way that this is playing out, Sarah is a thief, committing one of the most heinous crimes possible in a college setting. Yes, she stole from Buddy, who is obviously a disgusting individual that deserves at least something bad happening to him in the game. But if the developers didn't make a mistake and it's in the writing for the game that Buddy sent this message, the most likely outcome is that Sarah ripped him off. Otherwise, Buddy is some kind of hacker who warns his victims not to fall for his traps, knew what Sarah's thesis was going to be about, and repeated that information to her only to be completely ignored. If Buddy was creeping on Sarah and lifted her idea from some kind of document in her phone or computer, then she would have reacted right then and there. So we've got Sarah lying to her friends and mother about Derek when she didn't need to, and assuming the developers didn't make a huge mistake with formatting, stealing the concept of her final thesis from Buddy when, again, it seems like she just didn't need to. Sarah comes across as a relatively smart person, but what she's now shipping up to be is someone who just can't be trusted. Something isn't right with this girl, and we're actually not learning about her by going through her phone. This is the opposite of the dead man's cell phone situation. We're actually getting further from finding out who the owner was as a person. And now, strap in, because we're really about to see some serious lying in action. The first portions of the game that really freak players out are the haunted videos, and they really open up a track to see just how much we're being deceived. After finding this picture in the gallery, Iris comes up to say, It seems this photo correlates with a video and a chat thread that Sarah has recently deleted. You let Iris restore that information and find out that it's a chat thread with Sarah's contact James. James says that he has something for Sarah she might find interesting, considering she wants to start a blog about ghosts and curse research. This is where we receive the first haunted video. There are three major issues with this thread. The first problem is with Iris lending more evidence to how much we just can't trust them. When players click and hold on this photo, they are told by Iris, it seems this photo correlates with a video and a chat thread that Sarah has recently deleted. That gives us this message thread with James. It took place on April 30th, the night before we found the phone and started at 8.44. Iris told us that this thread correlates to the image we just found in the gallery, right? So we ought to be seeing something in these messages that correlates with that picture. But there's nothing. You can't find James talking about the picture. You can't find Sarah talking about it. The picture does not appear in the video. The picture isn't shared between the two having the conversation. And even when you consider the picture might have been taken during the conversation, we don't have a time on the image to tie it into this message thread that suggests that Sarah took the photo while talking to James. The way that Iris has been speaking all along has been pretty suspicious. Definitely above the level of any smartphone AI we've ever seen. But this kind of behavior completely defies any sort of logic. The only way Iris can argue that the deleted thread ties into the strange picture we found is by presenting information they're keeping secret. And that's only the first problem. The second problem is the video itself. It's just a messy bunch of horror images found from all over the internet, taken from fictional sources, and you can find those sources listed on the Itch.io page. The same goes for the second video that comes later in the game, which has glaringly obvious clips taken from Marble Hornets and a ridiculously well-known video that's pulled in about 6 million views. Unless someone performs some seriously potent black magic on the video, it has absolutely no power. It just looks like another fake deep web video someone put together and spread around, lying about its backstory. The third problem is a really tough one to suspend your disbelief over. On April 30th, Sarah wasn't just sent messages by James. She was also talking to Faith, who convinced her to go to the witch's feast known as Walpurgis Knot, and Irizu, a mysterious contact who claimed to be a friend of Faith. Here's how it went down. At 8.20pm on April 30th, Sarah sends messages to Faith asking where she is and why she hasn't been picking up. She's been calling for 15 minutes. Sarah continues texting until getting a 10 second audio clip of heavy breathing at 8.40. Four minutes later, she receives her first message from Irizu, claiming he got the number from Faith. Sarah replies to him at 8.45, 8.46, and 8.47, showing how nervous she's feeling about being at this party and talking to a stranger, who, as Sarah points out at 8.49, doesn't seem to know Faith very well at all. Meanwhile, she's getting messages from James and actually stops to answer him about something completely meaningless in this situation. Sarah is alone, in the woods, talking to a stranger who got her number from Faith, who hasn't picked up for well over half an hour now, whose last message was a 10 second audio clip of serial killer heavy breathing, and yet she has time to casually talk with James. You can say that she's trying to calm herself down with something more normal, but just look at this. 
At 8.54 and 8.55, she's telling Irizu to back off, making it very clear she's afraid. Five minutes later, she's watching the first video sent by James and saying, Haha, what is this, the 90s? Sounds pretty lame. I'm sorry, but I just don't buy it. There's nothing about the timing of these two events that works in a believable way, especially when we have the panicking video of Sarah just moments after this. It doesn't work. And by the way, that text thread with Iris was only given to us because Iris happened to find it after the video from James was opened and Iris became infected. Even after being hit with the same device-killing virus twice, Iris was somehow still standing and still managed to find a clue. The AI began talking about the Red Room, which was the title of the video and how it's connected to a cult. Again, Iris appears to be talking about things that only it knows, which makes it even harder to trust them. How does Iris know that this video, which is apparently connected to a cult, is also connected to Irizu, who has given no keywords in his messages about a cult? How does Iris even know at all that there's a deleted message thread connected to a possible cult member? The message was deleted. Iris would have needed to be restoring those messages in the background this entire time, going through them, and finding connections to the situation to present to us, performing thought processes that are so far above the level of any AI for a smartphone. The more that you study Sarah is missing, the more it collapses under the weight of all of these inconsistencies. Something just isn't right here, and it goes beyond Iris. There are so many moments popping up where the logic doesn't work, and it's very difficult to tell whether it's on purpose as part of a genuine story, or if the developers have made serious oversights all throughout the game. The way that I see it, if everything was done on purpose, then here's the story we're looking at. Sarah and Faith attended the Walpurgis Knot Festival. Faith was abducted, her phone was used by Irizu, and then Sarah was abducted. Irizu may or may not be connected with Walpurgis Knot. Maybe his cult are the only people celebrating in this area, and maybe he's an opportunist. What we do know is that Irizu is responsible for the videos, and while he sees them as a death curse, he's the only one responsible for making the death part work. The videos themselves are not cursed, and there's nothing paranormal about them. They're just carriers for very malicious viruses that take over someone's phone and provides control to a third party. In this case, I believe Irizu is the controller. Having deleted the evidence of his existence and stalking of the girls, which we can ascertain from the far-off picture taken of him by Sarah one night, Irizu left the phone behind to be discovered as a test for anyone who would come across it. Seeing as how he had control over the phone and Iris, he would be able to speak through the AI, convincing whoever picked up the phone to help Sarah, and use selective restoration points to create a breadcrumb trail leading to the choice between killing Sarah or Faith. I don't think Iris was completely overtaken by Irizu because in one of the three endings, if you fail to choose in time, Iris will automatically send a message to save Sarah's life. The AI, as unbelievably intelligent as it is, acts without you to serve its prime directive of helping Sarah. It might be Irizu getting impatient, still masquerading as Iris, or it could be the AI, but we don't know. This is the only way that any of this plot makes sense to me under all of the logic holes, the overly intelligent AI, and the inconsistencies. There are only two conclusions I can come to after studying the game. Either there is a method behind the madness, and it's all Irizu's doing, or the developers have made so many mistakes in writing and formatting that there is no fixing the game in its current state. Irizu is a stalker, hacker, and killer who's part of a cult, and Sarah and Faith came too close to his circle, with Sarah being involved only because Faith dragged her along. They weren't the only ones he was trying to attack because word about the Red Room video virus was getting around, but they fell for his trap. He made the videos out of whatever creepy images and videos he could steal online, which were not paranormal, but did have a major virus designed to take control and scare someone whose device is infected. The entire time, he was just playing you as part of a cult initiation, restoring whatever information he needed to at any given point to keep you on the trail. With everything else on the device, he controlled and changed information at will. Iris was too human because it was being operated at points by a human. There are no ghosts or supernatural forces in the game. Just some really evil individuals who wanted to see if you'd kill a poor, helpless, innocent girl after maybe catching on that she wasn't as good-hearted as her phone's AI would have you believe. If that's not the plot, then I think the game might be very broken in the storytelling department, and it needs a serious amount of rewriting before a full release. It's the only way I can see any of this making sense through what would otherwise be glaring errors and moments of completely ignoring logic for the sake of convenience. You can't make a smartphone game like this and have an AI system from about 10 years in the future on it and expect us to just believe that. And they can't just keep making connections to a situation for us out of thin air. Adding the option to make a comment about how smart this AI is does not solve the issue. You don't get to gloss over flaws in your writing by having a character point out the flaw in your writing and say, huh, that's pretty weird, right? Oh well, never mind. I'll go with it. 
<laughs> Who cares? I will admit this though. The game has a very cool format and a unique storytelling approach. It's just that Sarah is Missing is only good on that front. And once you look at it under a critical eye, it all falls apart. I'm sorry, but at the end of the day, this is a gimmick game. It has a hook, and that hook is very cool, but the full execution isn't done well enough to praise the whole game. But there is hope for a turnaround when it comes to Sarah is Missing. Even though you have to go through the Twitter account for the developer just to confirm this, it turns out that what's going around for Sarah is Missing is a demo. They hope to have the full game out early in the new year, and right now, they're probably working to make sure it's the best experience possible. I believe they can really make this a very solid game. It's just that a lot more attention needs to be paid to logic and writing. Iris needs to be scaled way down. Like really, really far down when it comes to intelligence. It has to be a much more realistic digital assistant who helps with the mystery case. It can't keep pulling up leads based on convenience for the player. If the plot I've been reading through the situations presented is correct, I understand how it's happening. But altogether, otherwise, I can't suspend my disbelief when it comes to Iris. And so many other small logical problems really take me out of the atmosphere. Is it alright for a demo to have issues like these? Is it acceptable to just say it's a demo and let it have a pass? It's certainly understandable for an early version to have issues, but I think so much of what's needed from releasing a demo is feedback that makes sure the full version is tightly made. Sarah is Missing is a very cool idea. It's a brilliant idea. Yes, it is a gimmick, but it's an awesome gimmick that works insanely well and provides a unique immersive experience. Now the developers just need to make sure that immersion isn't broken by some of the issues that wreak havoc on suspension of disbelief. I hope that despite whatever you may feel about Sarah is Missing, you have enjoyed this video. I usually never have major videos on things that I end up with a negative opinion on. This is actually kind of a first for me. I do like Sarah's Missing for how it's made, what it does, and what it can be in the full version. The potential is huge, and I think that Monsoon Labs can pull it off. It's just that this mystery game is one that wouldn't let me stop thinking about it and its problems. It was an elephant in the room that I had to address, and I'm glad I had the opportunity to do so. I do look forward to seeing the full version of Sarah's Missing in late winter, and hopefully I'll have a much different video to bring you about it. Major thanks to all of my supporters on Patreon who make it possible to produce more content now and in the future. Stick around to the end of this video to see all of their names. And thanks to you for joining me in the dark this evening. Once more, I'm Nick Nocturne, and I'll be seeing you again real soon. Sleep tight. the night Sarah disappeared. We have a lot of evidence from late in the game that Mark says the night before we find the phone when she was attacked by a kidnapper. Keeping this in mind, when you go through Sarah's videos, you'll find a recording from March 27th that has Sarah talking about whether or not ghosts are still relevant in today's society. She rambles a bit about the history of ghost stories, the inclusion of the vampire legend, and the modern adaptation of ghosts that work through cyberspace. It's basically the entire concept that we just got from Buddy. We learn through Sarah's conversations with her mother, Faith, and James that she's studying parapsychology, which is the scientific study of the supernatural. It makes sense that Sarah would be rehearsing what seems like the rough draft for a research paper on this topic because of the messages that we've read. After all, the email she receives later from her school reminds her that the deadline for submitting a final thesis is April 30th, so she only has just over a month left. But if Sarah is the parapsychology major, why would Buddy come across as saying that he's doing a thesis paper on the same exact thing much earlier? I'm going to level with you here. I think there's a pretty strong possibility the developers of the game just had a major, major typo when it came to this section. Look at the flow of conversation. Buddy asks Sarah what her thesis is on. She asks if he really does want to know. He says yes. And by the nature of dialogue, we should be seeing Sarah's reply next, which we would guess is about parapsychology stuff. But instead, we get Buddy offering what his thesis paper is about which actually doesn't seem all that out of line with a natural dialogue flow. Because we have Buddy, who obviously wants something from Sarah, offering free information so he can establish common ground in pursuit of his ulterior motives. But does that really seem like something Buddy would be into? It's really tough to gauge how serious...
Welcome back, Sarah, it says. This phone appears to be damaged and you don't appear to be Sarah. Have we met? The phone is aware that you're not its owner, but instead of asking how it knows that, you're given dialogue options that lead you away from finding out. An iris is part of an eye which allows dilation of the pupil for the amount of light that comes in, which is the very same function of a camera aperture, a structure we see as the icon for the iris application. Both of these are clues to let you know something very important. Iris is watching you through the phone's camera. It knows that you're not Sarah because it can see you. So, in the very beginning of the game, you open a smartphone that we see has been compromised with something malicious. We meet an application that very clearly has access to the camera pointed at your face. And that application is an AI system that sounds way, way too human to be genuine, to the point that the game itself wants you to be made aware of it. These are major red flags. Next up, we move into the messages where the bulk of our information can be found. Here's where we start to understand that we might not be able to trust Sarah either. On February 14th, which was both Valentine's Day and Sarah's birthday, she sent out a few messages. Some to Derek, her ex-boyfriend who had only just become an ex, and her mother. Derek, the ex-boyfriend, very much comes across as someone who has been broken up with. He expresses that he wishes the relationship could continue and that things had been different while Sarah is very clearly angry and offended. She says to Derek, Things ended when you left. You left. A few messages later, we know why he left. He's a photographer who accepted a job to go to another country and shoot nude models, and he must have waited until the very last minute to let Sarah know. Have you ever heard of the dead man's cell phone situation? It's only gotten traction in recent years, of course, now that phones appear to know more about a person than their own friends and family members do. The situation is named for a play by the same title which premiered in 2007, and it's all about a woman who, just like the player character in the game Sarah is missing, finds a cell phone that's clearly missing its owner. The usual questions you think about associated with this kind of thing come up, but during a playthrough of Sarah is missing, there are many more issues presented than a player expects to encounter like a very literal case of a cell phone missing its owner. The itch.io page for the game summarizes the plot like this. Sarah has disappeared under mysterious circumstances and your only lead is her mobile phone. Search for clues by investigating Sarah's personal messages, notes, emails, pictures, and videos while trying to piece together her final days. Unlock password protected files, uncover hidden messages, and decrypt lost data and figure out where she went, what she did, and how someone can disappear without a trace so suddenly. And from the beginning of the game, you aren't allowed to forget how important it is that you find Sarah. Her phone's AI system, Iris, is taking it way more seriously than you are throughout the journey. That's spelled I-R-I-S. Kind of sounds like another well-known smartphone AI whose name is spelled S-I-R-I, right? Except how? Those are the circumstances around their breakup. Derek left on a job he didn't tell Sarah about because it involved nude model photography and leaving the country, and just to really dig the knife in, it happened on Valentine's Day, which was also her birthday. Derek doesn't want the relationship to end, but Sarah has decided that it's over. So why does she later tell her mother, Derek and I have decided to end things, and tells Buddy, Derek broke up with me? The truth is that Sarah broke it off with Derek, but she's changing up her story with two different people when it's not necessary. We may be going through her phone, but how much can we actually learn about this person by doing so? We may not even be able to trust what we find on here. The next issue that comes from the text messages is a really weird one, and the circumstances around its meaning may actually be simple and kind of foolish, or might mean a whole lot to the investigation. For this, we turn to Sarah's worst contact, Buddy, who begins sexually harassing her through text right after talking about thesis projects for school. Sarah says that she's too busy to hang out because she needs to compose her final thesis. Buddy asks what she's writing about, and even though Sarah is noticeably cynical about his interest, he says to go for it. We then receive a message from Buddy. I'm doing a research on the relativity of ghost to culture and how it transcends from verbal tales handed down through the generations to a digital and cyberspace hauntings. Here's the problem with this. The message from Buddy came through on February 30th. When you unlock the gallery for the phone, you also unlock Sarah's videos. 
We know from the very first video we were shown that videos are named after the day they're taken by default. The cry for help video Ira showed us is titled 2016-0430. That's April 30th, 2016. That the inspiration for Iris isn't anywhere near smart enough to do half of what this app is capable of. And it expresses what seems like emotion based on its prime directive, claiming it has wants after being challenged about sounding human. It wants to find Sarah, the phone's owner, and encourages you to find the truth about what's happened to her. Which is funny, coming from an AI that doesn't come across as trustworthy at all. In fact, Sarah's Missing presents a situation that nobody seems to be catching in almost every major playthrough you can find on YouTube. Your responsibility is to find Sarah, to know the truth about where she's gone, but in almost every single area of the game besides that, the truth is what's actually at stake. That's what you're really trying to fight for. Sarah is Missing may as well have been called Sarah is Lying because there are contradictions, logic mistakes, and misdirection all over this story. Let's go back to the beginning, even before we meet Iris, the AI that sounds way too human. Before you're allowed to do anything, you're shown that Sarah's phone has suffered a system failure. There's no moving forward until you agree to a system restore. Once you do, the phone gets to work, but in trying to pull the messages together, it suffers a crash in the form of a jump scare. It looks just like one of the images you'd see in the first haunted video that you open later in the game. Right after this, we get to meet Iris and play the game, and that's where the first major mistake comes in for most people who seem to go through the experience. We already know the phone's been infected. The entire system is compromised. Not only did we need to perform a system restore just to get it working, the jump scare makes it very clear this phone is not okay. What Iris is offering you is a false sense of security in having a knowledgeable companion. And even then, your introduction should be enough to tip you off that Iris is not worth trusting.